I'm Lorraine Brivetta, your host, and with me tonight are our panelists. I will share with you a brief background on each, and in the speaker section below, we invite you to read their expanded bio. I'll start with Patricia McCorkadale. She is a professor emerita in the University of Arizona Department of Gender and Women's Studies and Dean Emerita of the Honors College. She's currently curating an exhibit plan for 2021 that celebrates the 100th anniversary of women's suffrage in the U.S. Also joining us is Tani Sanchez, University of Arizona Africana Studies professor. She's lectured extensively on African Americans' role in history. Dr. Sanchez is also the first Tucson chapter president of the Afro-American Historical and Genealogical Society. And lastly, we have Carol West. Carol is a longtime member and former president of the League of Women Voters of Greater Tucson. Carol also served on the Tucson City Council from 1999 to 2007. My thanks to all of you for joining us. All right, the video offered a fascinating national story and even highlighted New York State in its final days before passage. But let's take a moment and talk about Arizona. Dr. McCorkadale, I'll begin with you. When did Arizona give women the right to vote? Arizona gave women the right to vote in um, 1912 after we became a state. But the struggle began much earlier than that in 1887 when they first started in the territorial days trying to introduce legislation to give women the vote. And I brought visual aids for a couple of people that I think are really important. Um, this one, if you can see it, um, is Josephine Brawley Hughes. And she was active in the suffrage movement from 1891 to 1898. Uh, she was the wife of um, Lewis Hughes, who started the Arizona Daily Star. And so that gave her a platform for her beliefs. Uh, she came out of the women's uh, Christian temperance movement. The Arizona Daily Star was very opposed to um, liquor. And um, eventually in 1890, she decided to change her stance um, and work more on suffrage because she thought that getting women the vote would help with getting prohibition. Uh, and so she was active for a really long time. Uh, the other person is um, Frances Muntz, Frances Willard Muntz. And uh, she was, uh, oops, she was the second president or the third president of the suffrage movement in Arizona. Uh, she started in 1899 and worked through 1914. And um, she, was, um, she was a really amazing person who had very different strategies um, than um, Josephine Brawley Hughes. So they each tried different strategies to get things through. Um, when Munz was actually the president of the Suffrage League in Arizona, um, she was able to get the bill passed through both houses. Um, and that was in 1903. And the women were very excited. They'd been working for years and years and years. And then it was vetoed by Governor Brody. And uh, the reason that he gave was that he thought it would impede statehood. And uh, Maybe that was just an excuse, but that was his reasoning. And so women had to, again, adopt a completely different strategy um, as we tried, as we became a state. And then after statehood, they took an initiative to the voters. Uh, and it was actually the voters that decided suffrage for women. So women had given up on the political process because it hadn't worked um, in you know, 20, 30 years. Uh, and so uh, suffrage in Arizona was approved by the voters by the largest margin of any state in the country. Uh, I think it was uh, 60, 63, 68% that voted in favor of suffrage um, and it carried in every county in the state. And so I think that's something that Arizonans can be really proud of. And I'm sure that we could talk more about the strategies that they used if that's of interest. Carol, how is all this possible given that Arizona was still discovering itself as a state? Well, I, I give Carrie Chapman Catt some credit because she came to Arizona and uh, thought that uh, while Josephine Brawley Hughes had worked long and hard, it might be good to have some younger women involved. And that's where Frances Munns and Pauline O'Neill came in. And they worked with the labor unions and the miners and the Mormons um, to get this across and the, the strategies that they used were amazing. And incidentally, Frances Munns was the second uh, woman in the nation to be an elected uh, legislator. Uh, and so I have followed uh, her career and I'm just amazed and, and greatly admire her. 
Dr. Sanchez, in your research, any voices that perhaps played a more behind the scenes role that um, were left out of all this conversation? Well, in terms of vote, I don't really have a lot of information on that in terms of any kind of voting strategy. But I can say this, the women, the black women in Tucson, Arizona, were definitely active in everything, at least according to the notes I have. Um, they were petitioning the mayor because of the segregated pools. They wanted to have access or have their own pool. They, um, there's a park here called Estevan Park, and it was the black women, black women organized to a National Association of Colored Women's Club, they are the ones who, um, who, who got that park, Esteban Park, started. It was their activism. Um, they did the kinds of things that Black women were doing, such as um, uh, going to the courts and saying, what about children who have been arrested or in some way uh, indigent? Let's take care of them. So there are so many things I think that people don't realize how active women were, the, the black women here and how they were intent on making society better. Dr. McCorkadale, what sort of impact did those grassroots on the ground advocacy efforts really have in all this? I think the grassroots efforts were really important. I think one of the things about um, a Josephine Brawley Hughes strategy was to go work through the women's clubs of Arizona. And at that time when Arizona was only a territory, those women's clubs were pretty much elite white women. Uh, they didn't include Mormon women, they didn't include Mexican American women or native women or African American women. And so a big change was um, the, the uh, strategies of um, Frances Munz um, she wanted to organize a club in each, a suffrage club in each county in the state. And that's what she did. And she also reached out to make alliances with all these different groups, miners, farmers, Mexican-American uh, politicians, whoever she could. And then that meant when they had to go for a referendum later, it was the grassroots that really mattered. So they had six weeks after they became a state, um, when after the legislation was passed, to be able to get the signatures. And they needed 3,442, I believe. And they got 4,000 in six weeks. And it only cost them $2,000 because they had this great organization and they could go out and get signatures everywhere. And in their report, um, a National American um, Women's Suffrage Association, they were proud of the fact that they had Chinese people that signed and Mexican people that signed um, and Mormon women. So they were very proud of the diversity of the signatures that they got at that point. And even another amazing point is that the three political parties at the time, the progressives uh, forced the Democrats and the Republicans to support uh, yes. suffrage for women. So that also was a part of that. And back east, that that didn't happen. So that's another first, I would say. I would agree. Oh. I, I was going to say that one thing I think that was important was that the women had gotten tired of the politicians and working, trying to work through politics because they would go and they would talk to people and advocate, line up the votes. And then when it came to the votes, that's not what they got. That's and they right. were reliant on men. And so they started saying, doesn't matter, we're not going to try for one party or another, we're just going to go after people who will support this. And by showing that miners and a lot of voters, current male voters support women's suffrage, that will get the political parties and the politicos um, to change their minds. Right. You've all used the word progressive. I mean, what was it that was taking place in the state of Arizona that really, um, that gave this effort such momentum? Carol? Well, I, th I think our governor, or governor-to-be at the time that he was the uh, chair of the uh, Constitution Convention, and he brought a lot of progressive uh, points forward, the initiative, the um, referendum, and so on. And the recall of judges, which of course was a problem when uh, President Taft was going to sign our statehood bill, that had to be removed. But then the next election, it was put back in. And he wanted a strong corporation commission because the railroads were not always uh, so good to the, the people. And so there were a lot of things that uh, President or Chairman Hunt added to that 
um, and a lot of backroom dealing. Maybe that wasn't so good, but it seemed to come out to be a pretty progressive constitution overall. I think the labor unions were really important too, and mining was really big industry in the state. And 95% of the labor unions came out in favor of women's suffrage when they had the voter initiative. And I think that really helped them too. And a lot of progressives were farmers, farmers and ranchers who were interested in you know, progressive, um, the progressive movement and their land rights and water rights and things like that. So I think that helped too. I like to point out to Dr. Sanchez something that I'm very proud of. The League of Women Voters formed in Tucson in 1941, and we have black charter members. So that's another, another point that I think is important. It, you know, and I'm very proud of that, and I think our organization is very proud of that. I was at the um, Arizona Historical Society a few years ago, and there is a photo there called the Republican Club, and you can see pictures of African Americans. There's just a handful, and um, very proud, dressed very well. So obviously politics were involved, and I think the date on that was about 1910, something like that, very early part of the century. But in terms of a progressive movement, um, one of the things that I've been reading is how African American club women, they began to perceive of themselves, in fact, this whole national, these national clubs, these clubs that stretched across many different states. The idea was that at one point, um, the community was really local, but after slavery ended, after emancipation, people began to perceive of themselves as a national kind of community, a national society. And because there was so much oppression going on, people could relate. They could relate to what other people were doing. They're saying, yeah, we have these same kind of similar problems, whatever it is, be it voting or be it uh, poverty, those were big ones. And uh, concerns, of course, about anti-lynching. So people perceived of themselves in national ways. And the clubs in Arizona, the Phoenix Club and the clubs in Tucson, and I think there was one in Sierra Vista, um, these clubs also attended national meetings. So they were connected, whatever was going on, if there was a push for one thing, if the associations were um, 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 supporting different uh, agendas of different other groups, because they certainly had connections to white groups, um, people knew about it. There were referendums on the floor, the national meetings, they would go back to the uh, local people and say, hey, this is what we're doing. So there were a lot of connections. So it seems Arizona often gets this reputation for the Wild West. It seems to me more like a myth now that I'm hearing the three of you talk about its rich history and its progressiveness um, given this movement. Is that accurate, Dr. McCorkendale? I think there's still elements of the Wild West or <laughs> elements of that. I mean, clearly the divisions between the Native peoples who were originally here and the people who came as settlers um, you know, is part of that myth. Um, and um, Josephine Brawley Hughes in the Arizona Daily Star argued a lot about what was called the Indian question. Um, and that was part of the Republican national platform in, in the early 1900s. And that was to take all the Apache people and remove them from Arizona to Florida so that they would be fewer native people in Arizona. And so I think that that's part, of, um, that's part of our history that shows some of the divisions that there were that is part of that myth. Um, and I think also that, you know, people in Arizona wanted to do it their own way and they were very strong about that. I think that they were independent thinkers and those independent thinkers, some of them were, you know, suffragists um, and some of those independent thinkers were unionists and some of those independent people, um, you know, had very, um, important views about the races and what the races, the place of the races were in Arizona. And I think that's part of our history too. Okay, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that. We do have an audience who is watching this uh, very conversation. They have some questions, but we also have a poll and I just wanna give you an idea as to one of the questions we've asked this evening. Do you feel the picketing should have continued throughout World War I? So we'll go back just a bit here. 88% of our uh, audience tonight says, yes, the work of suffrage should have continued. No, the picketing should have stopped during the war. That was 13%. I wanna ask um, 
a question here uh, that came from actually an audience member, but what impact did the war have upon the effort of securing the vote for women? Dr. I McCorkadale? Oh, I think the, the, that the uh, war had a huge um, impact because women had to fill jobs. And so you had women in all different kinds of jobs, making equipment, making cloth, making uniforms, uh, filling in for men who were serving in the war. And that expanded the view of women and their proper role in society. And one of the reasons I think that there's so much suffrage in the Western states, uh, starting with Wyoming, which is the first state to grant suffrage to women, is that the view of women was different in a place where women had to be hardworking. They had to be entrepreneurs. They had to do manual labor. They were farming. Um, and I think that the war did that in a way by showing that women had a lot more strength and capability um, than uh, people might have believed. Carol? By, by 1914, every Western state allowed women to vote except New Mexico. So uh, that really illustrates pretty well what, what she said. Uh, so, you know, um, women were considered partners. Their husbands often had to go off, they'd homestead, and then the husband would have to find a way to support them and the woman would stay there and till the land and take care of the animals and and, and I think maybe in some cases even help construct the structures. So uh, women were, they were, uh, in fact, I believe, I forget the year, but it's around 1900, 43% of women in Arizona were employed in some way where the figure nationally was 15%. That's a pretty amazing statistic when you think about it. And it shows how uh, women just, well, not just in this state, but all across the West were engaged in working in some way to further the, their uh, families' goals as well as their state, state's ability to become a state in the first place. And the film talks about this, um, and, and as we know, we'll see more of it this week, but one of our audience members would like to know what poor women um, thought or felt about what was going on, but I also want to cast a wider net and minority women. I mean, what were their roles in all of this? Dr. Sanchez, can we start with you on this one? When you say in all of this, what, what do you mean? I'm so sorry. I, I could not hear you. When you, say, when you say in all of this, what do you mean? In, in the momentum for, for voting in Arizona, in, throughout the country, but women coming from a socioeconomic dis disadvantage. I mean, is there some idea that this was only something for women who could afford to, to pick it outside the White House or could, who could travel to um, Washington? One of the things that black women did was um, they saw the vote as a tool. They recognized that um, there were larger issues going on, like lynching was going on, poverty was going on, Jim Crow was going on. So women were definitely um, interested in promoting their rights and their ability to operate like anyone else, but there was a larger issue. Um, the way they saw it was they were in... Um, they were in distress in terms of their communities. They wanted to make their communities safer. They wanted to uplift the population. They recognized um, that they were not being treated fairly or equitably. So the vote, the push to get the vote was a mechanism to get black women voices in there in order to change the structure. It was a mechanism. It was part of a holistic kind of approach to being black and to being disenfranchised. Um, there were some black women that did become known, at least nationally, uh, maybe not in, in Tucson, maybe on a local level, known as being women that represented the community. Um, but, but the idea was there, there were kind of like competing goals going on here. For a lot of white women, it was like, let's get the vote to show that we're equal to our husbands. For black women, the whole history had been such deep exploitation. There was nothing to prove in terms of we can be like men because women had been on plantations and beat and forced to work in certain ways. So it was really about having a voice, having an electoral voice 
where when decisions were made, when policies were, were put out, black women could add to the vote. And that, that was a big deal. Oh. I agree that there were different motives that people had, um, but I think that many white women were also motivated because they wanted to see labor laws changed. They wanted to see widow's benefits changed, mm -hmm. they wanted to see protection for child workers. And that's part of the reason that labor unions supported suffrage because they thought that women would work on this legislation when they got the vote. And, um, and so working class women were very much part of the suffrage pickets. They were part of the parades and the protests that they had. Uh, they did a lot of work in raising funds um, for the movement. And I think it's interesting that, um, that Frances Munns, one of the first acts of legislation that the first act of legislation that she um, sponsored in Arizona was to double the benefit that widows got. Um, in terms of supplemental income from after their husbands died. Um, they also passed um, laws limiting the number of hours that people could work and setting a minimum wage. And so that was also an anti-suffrage argument. Don't let women have the vote because then they're going to want to protect women and children and families and that'll create a whole lot of things that will hurt capitalism. Uh, so that was part of their argument too. So I think that that was a strong motive that appealed to both middle-class women and also really appeal to working class women. And those are issues that black women would have automatically supported as well. But there were other things that were going on. When you started having, having women uh, register, um, it changed the course of things, it, particularly in the North, not so much here in Arizona because the percentages of black people were so small. But all of a sudden you had the first black alderman um, 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 elected. And a lot of that is because of black women. I mean, and then all of a sudden, because most of those women were Republican, you started having different policies. So there was a lot of pressure for black women not to be registered to vote, a lot of legal action and, and all of the things, the poll taxes, um, mm -hmm. uh, the literacy, literacy tests, grandmother clauses, or they call them yeah. grandmother clauses, um, to get to make sure that black women didn't get the vote because it would really upset the balance of things. Not, and not just uh, in terms of uh, women's rights, which were certainly important. I mean, there was no question that black women were supporting that. But there were other things that black women were looking at as well. Carol, do you have anything you'd like to add? Well, uh, one of the things, uh, they, the women got the right to vote. And the first thing that happened is that the political parties, especially in the East, just ignored them. They couldn't get on uh, any of the platform committees and uh, some of the uh, parties would work to uh, put forth certain candidates. They didn't get anywhere with any of that. And so finally, Harry Chapman Catt decided on the nonpartisan League of Women Voters. And that organization, I'm proud to say, uh, spent a lot of time on the issues that we've been discussing, the women's issues in particular, and studying those issues and uh, bringing them to the legislators and asking them to support them. And that has happened a lot here in Arizona to the present day. Let me ask a question. Uh, this comes from an audience member. And I, pardon me, but I'm assuming this is correct. I, I haven't done my research on this, but Isabella Greenway was the first woman to be an Arizona representative in Congress. Is that correct, Dr. McCorkendale? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yes. Um, at the time, Arizona only had one representative. Anybody like to comment on this? This again, coming from one of our audience members. You mean, why was she a representative? She was appointed after her husband died, I believe. What was her, her role? I mean, was she an advocate and during since she took on this position? An advocate for women and women's issues? Yes, I'm so sorry. I'm having a hard time hearing you, but I think I heard an advocate for women's issues. Yes. I believe she was an advocate for women's issues. She had been very involved in a lot of Arizona politics. Um, she was um, well connected nationally to a lot of important women. Um, she was, I believe, friends with um, Eleanor Roosevelt. Yeah. So I think that she was um, that she was very active when she was um, in office uh, to promote uh, women's issues. And for sure. To to add to that, 
uh, we mentioned earlier that during the First World War, women helped uh, with all kinds of things. At the time, Isabella Greenway was Isabella Ferguson living in Silver City, New Mexico, and she helped bring in the crops there. So she wasn't afraid to get her hands dirty and uh, work hard for uh, things along that needed to be done. Okay, let's move on to this question that we talked about just a bit before um, the panel discussion began. Uh, the suffragists had strong media coverage. How are they able to get reporters um, on board with covering their efforts back then when times were so polarizing? Well, my answer to that would be that in part, there were a lot of newspapers, a lot of competing newspapers at the time. And um, Alice Paul published The Suffragist, uh, which was a newspaper that promoted suffrage views. It was very cheap. They, they, they published it. They had people that went out and sold it. It helped their cause. Um, there was also a lot of handbills that were printed uh, that had, you know, visual representations of states that supported suffrage or the arguments for or against suffrage after the anti-suffrage um, league was founded. So um, I think that that was part of it. And then a lot of the, of the national newspapers wanted to cover it because um, they liked to cover uh, things that uh, were controversial and suffrage was controversial. So sometimes you would see in these old newspapers an argument for and an argument against. Um, that would be printed side by side almost uh, so that they would be, sh be showing what the arguments and, and what the issues were that were involved. Carol? Well, I, I think uh, that Woodrow Wilson wasn't very happy about the picketers getting so much attention in the news media, and he tried to squelch that, but I think that backfired when these women were force fed and beaten and so on in jail when they came out of jail, you know, they were emaciated and weakened and the public sympathy was definitely on their side. And you can't help thinking that that helped put suffrage over the top. I think that the title of the film is really important because it's upping the ante. So, you know, they were the first group to pick it and then they got opposition. You know, people came and spit on them and knocked them over and ripped up their banners. And so of course that, you know, was a more public event than them just standing there day after day. Um, and then after they started being arrested and jailed, um, put in solitary confinement, force feeding, it just kept escalating more and more. And it got more and more media attention, I think, because of the severity of harm that was being done to women and women were set, you know, putting their bodies on the line. Um, in England, several women were killed um, in various suffrage activities. And I think in the United States, they were very afraid of that because that would really sway public opinion um, if women gave their lives uh, to be able to vote. Dr. Sanchez, the media coverage, was it fair toward the black community during that time? I would say that it was mostly absent. I remember going through some of the uh, early newspaper articles um, because I was doing research on something else and you just really didn't have very much about black people. In terms of uh, black women's clubs, this particular club I'm talking about, they would have social events, they would have um, notices about meetings. So there was something going on. Um, if they had a convention here in Tucson, it was definitely listed in the papers. But things that were really affecting Black people, I could not find a lot of that. Not, not during the time period, if we're talking about um, 19, um, 19 teens up to the, maybe the 1930s, I could not find it. Not in the newspapers. Okay, let's go to an audience question. question. Let me say this. Black people also had their own newspapers. And there were a lot of people that were subscribing to the Chicago Defender. And, and again, there was this different kind of sense of community that I'm, I'm not so sure exists uh, in the same way today. So people would know what was going on. They would know what about lynchings that were happening in Detroit or in Florida or some other place. So it may not have been in the mainstream media, but definitely Black networks of communication where we're conveying information. Okay, let's go to an audience question. Um, in states that allowed women to vote before it was ratified, did they have full voting rights? Dr. McCorkadale? 
The voting rights varied a lot from place to place. In some places, women were allowed to vote for school boards and virtually nothing else. Sometimes they were allowed to vote in local elections, but not statewide elections. Sometimes they were allowed to vote in state elections. Um, recently, I visited Washington, D.C. and saw a special design for a voting booth. And there, they had a, um, a physical barrier that they could put over the ballot to black out the parts where women weren't allowed to vote in various states. Women could only vote on some parts. And I, I walked by it and I thought, what is that? That doesn't make any sense. And then I went back and looked at it and that's what it was. It was to keep women to, from voting on the things they weren't supposed to, to black it out for them. And then they could turn in their ballot. Now, Carol, I'm anything to add? Oh, Dr. Sanchez. I'm not sure I understand the question. This is before the ratification and passage of, of the 19th Amendment you're talking about. Right. Okay. right. I did have some information on what happened um, after that, but uh, not, not, not too much before. Carol? Except, except I can say in the South, the same old Jim Crow laws seem to apply to women. So in other words, um, they still had to take the literacy test. Uh, in one place, I think it was North Carolina, um, a, a grandfather, grandmother clause. In South Carolina, they had to pay a $300 voting tax. So, you know, the issue was a combination of race and gender. It, you just couldn't really separate them. Okay, another question here, this one from an audience member. What is the relationship between the women's suffrage movement and the abolition movement? Who wants to tackle this one? Well, I know that many of the women who were involved in suffrage were also abolitionists and they were Quakers. As a matter of fact, Alice Paul descended from William Penn uh, in Pennsylvania and her family, I believe, were Quakers. Um, and many of, many of these women, especially in the East, I don't know about the West so much, but a lot of those people were abolitionists. Um, so that, it, you know, when you think back to Susan B. Anthony, remember she registered to vote and voted for U.S. Grant uh, in, eight, I think it was 1872, and she was an abolitionist. And I think also a temperance uh, worker, if I remember correctly, and a Quaker. So um, they were very actively involved in, in the suffrage movement, so far as I know. Well, I think that there's a, a direct connection between the experience of women in the abolition movement and then their growing interest in suffrage. So Susan B. Anthony and Lucretia Mott, very active in the suffrage movements, went as delegates to various conventions, both nationally and internationally, but they were not allowed to speak in the meetings. Sometimes they were not actually allowed to be seated with the male delegates. And so they were like, wait, what? You know, we're, are, we're working on this as much as the men, how come we have no voice? Um, and so that's how they started working on um, the suffrage movement. Um, and Susan B. Anthony voting and getting arrested for voting. She was arrested yeah. when, she, when she voted after she voted. Um, that's why they, um, they, they call the, the 19th Amendment the Susan B. Anthony Amendment to honor her and her work um, as both a suffragist and an abolitionist. And U.S. Grant um, pardoned the registrars who allowed her to vote. Um, he was not a, a suffragist himself, but he did believe in uh, women's rights uh, in a lot of ways as far as employment and brag that he had appointed a lot of women uh, postmistresses and I believe that included some black women as well. One of the things was um, it seems as if what I've read about the, uh, the period the abolitionist movement uh, the 15th amendment after blacks were emancipated, the, the, the 15th Amendment they gave black men the right to vote, that's where there really was kind of a schism in uh, mm -hmm. feminist movements. Um, part of it was that there was a lot of anger. There was a feeling that, okay, we work for abolition. This amendment should apply to white women, not just mm -hmm. black men. Uh, so that was part of the schism. Uh, and people were saying, some black people were saying, take this in increments and, and so some things came out that sounded kind of racist that no they didn't sound racist they were racist but 
it was a schism and it's one of the things where you're all working toward equality you're working for human rights but there's just so much that when you start bringing race in there that it doesn't work but that was a schism i think also with um white women feeling they don't want to support maybe or make race a focal point and not all but some I think it's related I think it's related to the war too because after the civil war they were working on reconstruction and one of the arguments that they made was that if they made suffrage more universal that it would hurt the reconstructive at reconstruction effort and that right now they were fo focusing on you know lots of issues involving black men and um, and that it wasn't women's turn. Um, and there were lots of women that didn't like that, you know, that thought it should have been a universal suffrage at that time. They were afraid that they had been forgotten and that they were going to have to fight a long time, which they did. And, and there was a feeling, there was a feeling also that if you make universal, if you put um, black women in, in the picture, that it would alienate southern state that all these efforts for right. getting states to allow women to vote sure. that just leave the race issue off let's not antagonize people and a lot of actions occurred out of that kind of sentiment and that was one of the reasons that alice paul persisted during the war with her picketing uh she thought susan b anthony made a big mistake because she kind of stepped away from suffrage during the civil war with, uh, with promises that suffrage would become a, a part of the reconstruction. And of course, as Dr. Sanchez has pointed out, that didn't occur. Okay, you mentioned um, the 15th Amendment. Let's talk about Native Americans. So the 15th Amendment was ratified to prohibit states from denying a male citizen the right to vote on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Did that include Native Americans? or did their struggle to vote follow a different path? Dr. McCorkadale? So their struggle to vote followed a different path. Um, they were not seen as citizens originally. Um, they were seen as, because they were the native nations, that they didn't have citizenship in the United States. So that was the first legal battle that had to be fought. Uh, as soon as they won that battle, then there were all these restrictions like literacy and all kinds of other registration issues that suppressed their vote. And it wasn't until, um, in the 19, um, 1948, when two GIs who had returned from the war sued again to be able to get the right and so that registrars could not um, preclude Native Americans from registering to vote. Um, similarly, Chinese people were not seen as citizens until the Chinese Exclusion Act was repealed in, I believe, 1932. Um, and it was that um, Civil Rights Voting Acts of 1965 that really cleared away these literacy laws and the poll taxes um, and some of the other barriers. That's not to say that we don't have issues with voter registration and voter suppression that continue to today, uh, but those groups were um, pretty much excluded for a very long time. Okay, I wanna um, go back to another poll question that we have for our audience tonight. What do you think is a more effective path toward national change, state by state or national action? 14% of our audience say state by state, 29% say national action, and 57% say they are both important. Now I wanna pose that question to you, the panelists. Um, the question again, what do you think is more effective path toward national change, state by state or national action? And Carol, we'll start this one off with you. Well, uh, judging from the suffrage issues, uh, it seems to me that if we can all uh, work together, I wish our Congress, for example, would start to work uh, to, well, I'm concerned about some of the uh, things that have happened to the Voting Rights Act. You know, parts of it have been overturned and we're seeing voter suppression again. And I think if we would work together on these things, but you know, uh, I read something in passing and I, I probably shouldn't mention it, but the 1789 US Constitution did give states the power uh, on voting issues in particular. And so we've got kind of a mishmash and it might be better if we were more consistent across the country, it wouldn't be so confusing for our citizens. Dr. Sanchez, we'll go with you. And, and I should note to the panel, we've got a, just a couple minutes left. 
Um, I tend to think maybe something national is more in order, at least for this time. It disturbs me that I think it was in uh, 2013 that they repealed the section of the Voting Rights Act of uh, 1965, and that allows states to make some determinations without federal oversight. And that's right. where we're getting all of this voter ID and some of these other things that seem to be disenfranchising uh, people of color and other poor groups. Dr. Mark Corkadale? Well, I think the state by state strategy takes a long time and it leads to people having different rights in different places in our country. And I think that it doesn't make sense for someone who lives in Arizona to have different rights than someone who lives in Kansas or someone who lives in Florida. And so it leads to a lot of inconsistency from place to place. And if we have national obligations as a society in a democracy, like voting, you know, like being paid a, a, a living wage, um, like being able to have the right to free speech, then it seems to me that people should be able to have those regardless of which state that they live in. That's right. Discussion tonight. Um, my thanks to the three of you. We certainly appreciate your time um, serving on this panel. And thank you to our strongest supporters here for joining us this evening and for sharing your questions. We certainly appreciate your help in making this program and others poss possible for all of our viewers and listeners. On behalf thank of you. Arizona Public Media, I'm Lorraine Rivera. Have a good night.